Jamie, 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 welcome to the First Half Podcast. I'm so glad you're here to join us, especially at a very exciting time uh, in 2024 for you. So uh, thank you, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, so look, man, uh, there, there's there's a lot of things we want to dive into. The, the big thing about the First Half Podcast, we talk about culture, we talk about fashion, art, football, all the things that you're definitely into, uh, so you're a perfect fit. Um but I, we got to start off with with the fact that you're a Montreal boy. You're playing for your Montreal club. Uh, now that you're in the U.S. playing in the MLS with Portland, um, what's the excitement of moving cities like? I mean, that can be extremely nerve wracking, especially for young athletes too. You know, new city, new food, new smells, new culture, new training, everything. Um, so, you know, what is your what is your feeling on that? on on this new adventure you know where are your where are your excitement levels yeah definitely i think first of all first and foremost i'm just grateful that i was able to spend so much time here in montreal it's usually rare for someone to stay so long in one professional team i was lucky to do it for nine ten years including the academy years um but for me it was it was an opportunity to to change you know a different chapter in my life good and uh good opportunity change environment as well and uh like you said obviously there's a little bit of nerves way into it because it's my first real big move yeah. uh essentially just packing my whole life from here clothes uh equipment uh things for the house now i gotta like make sure i'm ready to go for the cooking the cleaning and all in my apartment mm-hmm. and everything like that um it's it, it for that side of it it's a little bit nerve-wracking but the other side of it too like you're you're learning you know, to live in a different state right now. Uh, I know nobody on the team as well, so it's going to be completely new. Oh, yeah, there's there's zero. So there's zero. Well, actually, I'm not sure exactly what's happening with one player who, I, who used to play for Montreal, actually, Sherrick Miller. Okay. Uh, he's in negotiations with, um, ongoing right now, so we'll see what happens. But other than that, nobody. Now, is that, a, is, that, is that a good thing? Is that maybe super refreshing, or is that just add some more of, like, new kid at school kind of vibes and, you know, how is this all going to fit? You know, how am I going to sort of slot into, you know, the regulars? And obviously there's a lot of change. There's always changes in the off season before the new season starts. Um, but that's got to have all kinds of sort of mental replications. Yeah, the way I see it is I'm actually a little bit excited because once again, like I've built such a foundation here in Montreal where I was always there when the new guys would filter in and then the old guys would filter out. So I would kind of be the, you know, the ones to greet the new players and all that. But now I'm excited to see the other part of it where, how does that new player come in and, you know, how does how does everybody else make them feel at home? And for me, just it's an opportunity to start fresh, to meet new people, to meet new faces. And I think there's nothing more than just expanding your circle and, and again, meeting new people. When you knew that this was going down, do you start to reach out to players on on the team that you're making this move to and saying, hey, I'm coming into town, I'm coming into town a little early, can I get to... Uh connect can you show me around a little bit like do you do any of that sort of proactive activity or is it more of uh you really will meet everybody for the first time at training and then you go from there because again you're in the world that we live in we literally all can reach out to each other on on cell phones right so is there any of that going on where you you know you're already saying hey you're coming to town you knew this was happening coming to town can we connect in some way before uh we meet for the first time at the training ground for me, actually, uh, I haven't really reached out to anyone because I really don't know anybody on that specific level. So what I'm going into this uh, with that mindset is once I go in, um, obviously I know that, you know, the way the MLS works is that you're put up in a hotel, they take care of your hotel for a couple of weeks, and then you go in and meet the guys first day in or whatever the medicals are uh, and hoping to, you know, I know there's a there's a Canadian player as well who's on that team. Um, so hopefully we could... Bon, bon Don Poutine. Uh, no, that's no, a joke. It's, uh, actually, it's Tony Bust. No, no, exactly that. Maybe in the off season, but not in the not during the season. But no, I'm really going into it not knowing anyone. I haven't reached out. I just want to go in, you know, just fresh, meeting everybody like on the get go in person, and then just building a relationship through the uh, through there. The uh, new coach, right? So uh, it's Gary Neville. Bill. Oh, uh, sorry. Excuse me. Yeah, sorry. So I was watching too much of the uh, the other Neville's uh, podcast, but. Um, yeah, right. So so with with Phil Neville being there, he's obviously got huge footballing experience. He's had a bit of time in the MLS. Now it's brand new and fresh. So that's sort of exciting too to be part of this all new, fresh experience that's gonna go down uh in Portland. Have you done any research on on the coach to see 
how you can make sure that, you, you know, you're going to fit in the big picture? Or is that one of the things where if you coming right away at this point, you already feel like that's part of the picture anyways, right? Mm. Well, for me, like, I don't, I wouldn't go as far and say in doing research. I obviously remember, you know, his time in Miami and how his, you know, structure of play was. And we had a couple of teammates who got traded to Montreal from Miami who played with him. So I kind of had an idea of how he was uh, on the day to day and how he was as a coach. Obviously I'm fully open and looking forward to, you know, meeting him in person and then seeing how he works in person as well. But we've had a couple of calls as well and, uh, just, you know, explaining to each other what our goals were for this season, how I could help, uh, how he could help me and how I could help him in terms of what the visions are for him and for the club. And I think that, I think it's, it's just time to play and then it's just exactly going into preseason and then putting, you know, the words to onto the pitch that, you know, just do your job. And it was exciting, dude. It, I mean, uh, fresh city, dude, the fresh city and Portland's and, and Portland's a wicked city, right? Then the fan base is phenomenal. That's actually something I wanted to ask you. We should talk about that Timbers army cause they're, they're pretty intense. Um, we've actually had some of those guys at one of our pubs, uh, they've come down for a few of the games, um, where I, I'm just going to jump into the question that we can go sort of back and forth, but out of all the sort of fan bases that you've seen while traveling, you know, throughout the, the U S and Canada, is there one specific fan base that you would say is just, you know, let's just say above the rest, they're just loud, they're noisy, they're scary. They add an atmosphere that's actually quite intimidating for, for the away team, the visiting team um, that I've played in. That you, yeah, that you've played in personally. Um, I would say the Orlando fans were kind of not necessarily. I've never. I wouldn't say I was ever intimidated, but you know they were kind. They were, in, you know, there's yeah. Times, fine. The, the word intimidation's yeah. wrong. Yeah, so they were intense. Yeah, yeah, intense. Uh, in the sense that there's some fans that like sometimes they'll say, obviously, as a goalkeeper, I hear most of it, right? Yeah. So behind the net, whether you're screaming or saying something, I'll probably hear, uh, but tune it out. <laughs> you do hear. Uh, you do hear. Yeah, that's true. You hear a lot. But uh, some some of the stuff that you know. They say are funny or, or just, you know, just a typical American saying or however they would insult someone. Yeah. Um, but I do think that Orlando, because of their Latin culture as well, sure. were there. If they're way more passionate and they're way more vulgar when it comes to yeah. um, supporting and then just. It's, it's like that's bred in yeah, the, the Latin football yeah, culture exactly. that they've been brought up in. And I've heard some, not that I've understood a word they said, to be honest, I don't speak Spanish at all. But I could tell that they were ripping me from ripping. Yeah. yeah. But you're gonna you're you're gonna you gotta take Spanish. Oh, it's like sort of being that way. I need to do. Yeah. I really need to learn Spanish. No, that's gonna be a great move. It'll be a great move too, because if all of a sudden you bark back with some sort of some sort of quip in Spanish, exactly. Like, hey, they'd be shocked. We're a little what white up, guy. For sure. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> yeah, the white boy. Um, internationally, then, because you you do have that experience to any international stadium or fans that you were just like, oh my god, this is a whole other level. Something, yeah. yeah. Going to, I mean, playing at Azteca Stadium is all is, likely it's Mexico is just insane. Yeah, insane. The whole one of the whole stadium, obviously, and obviously, the whole thing. obviously because of the fact that it's a historic stadium and you've seen what's happened there. But, but yeah, it's uh, one of the worst places. Playing I've been in the Algiers, playing in the yeah. We won't, we won't bring that up. I right? won't bring up Maradona. But just this, yeah. the, the, you could feel the culture, feel the passion of, in that stadium. And then obviously playing in the altitude, it's already a disadvantage for you. And then you got the fans, 50, 60,000 fans whistling at you every time you get the ball. And to be honest, I think CompuCap is very underrated in that aspect because it's so difficult to go to Honduras and play El Salvador, Panama, because the pitches aren't great. The fans are on top of you. They're throwing things. They're screaming. They're there at your hotel till one, two in the morning, one, making two, noise before, like, right? Yeah. It's just these are the things that people don't see. And yes, we are at a point right now where Canada, we've taken that jump, and we are expected to beat these teams. But it's also very difficult to go into these environments and get results. But that's you know, if you're a good team and you want to aspire to win in the next level, these are the results on an international exactly. level. Exactly. And you, you need to deep and get those points. So, a, so a team in your, in, in this case, I, I'm going to use Canada as an example, has to be on top of all of it, not just training and not just the opponent at the moment, but how is the entire plan going to roll out from even, how are we going to make sure these guys are getting some good rest the night before? That's amazing. 
I know, I mean, we know it as when you're, when you're addicted to football, you know, what goes on sort of the night before. I mean, like, dude, Europe and Latin America, people are starting to part, you know, starting to get geared up for the match as of like nine, eight, nine in the morning, you know? So by the time the 1230 or three o'clock kickoff is yeah, like, everybody is in the, in the lit, right? So there's definitely that. So that, that's a great, that's a great commentary on sort of the whole picture. And Concav has done a lot to sort of, um, expand that sort of that energy within you know the north american game especially the canadian game um providence park uh th- there was something that's funny enough the montreal i'm only using montreal's example because you guys you know you, you just have one club you know for where you're going now in, in portland which is super exciting you guys don't you don't get to you get to play you don't get to come back too much you, there's no montreal there's no we'll play to get each other yeah last year. yeah it's too bad that would have been fun right like i think it Every two years or something right. like that, and I'm assuming in not this season, the next season, they probably come to Portland. Yeah, but either way, it's, it would have been fun to have you guys sort of show up. The the schedule was a bit interesting this year because I think now that San Diego's coming in a year, right? I believe was Nashville in the West last year or in the East. I'm not sure. I, I thought I saw Nashville in New York in the West. I think now they're they. I could be wrong. Maybe they're back in the east. Uh, okay. Maybe because okay. San Diego's coming in in a year. So there's going to be that shift. So we have in the schedule I saw, we play Vancouver three times yep. and we play Seattle three times. So we're playing two teams in the West again. Well, I mean, I'm in the West, no. which is weird to say, but. Uh, we're up west of you, you gotta get, dude, cowboy hat, the whole thing. Then I'm joking, Venice. But it's just, there's something with the schedule now that you're playing two teams three times and not two. Usually it's a home and away. When you play in your conference, but now because of this, there's one odd. I mean, not yet, but I think they moved the team. I could be, maybe that's why we're not playing that many teams in the East. Yeah, They're, well, yeah, and it's also. I mean, again, it's they've planned this for the for, oh, for, for travel. Yeah. Um, well, then I guess I'll just jump into League's Cup because there's League's Cup again this year, uh, July. Yeah, and that will be at the tail end of Copa America in America, and the Euros obviously in Europe. Um, that's going to be a pretty intense summer. It's a tournament. It game, the game, the whole, we'll, we'll, yeah. And then we're going to have U.S. Open Cup as well. I don't know when that starts. It's yeah. kind of like the Canadian Championship. Yeah. Just, yeah, the MLS tried to pull out, then everybody was yelling, yeah. and then they came back in, and nobody they tried to put the reserves. The like, MLS next, next, MLS next, yeah. Which, anyways, that's a conversation for people with a higher pay grade. Um, but yeah, Lynx Cup, you excited about that? Super. Super. Yeah. I think it's going to be. Were you excited about that tournament in the, in, in the, from the get? Yeah, I think it's a cool concept. You know, like why not play against the Mexican teams? And some people don't have the luxury because they don't make it to the CONCACAF, and that's the only time we'd be able to play. If you win the Canadian Cup or the US Open Cup or the MLS, you'd go into the Champions League, and now you're giving everybody the opportunity to see what that kind of level is in the Mexican league. And listen, it's a lot of games, but uh, at the end of the day, you want to play, right? You're you're professional, you want to win trophies, and then this is another way for you to win a trophy and then punch your ticket to the Champions League. Why not? But the but but does an athlete sort of also want a little bit of time in between? Because my questioning is because you're gonna have athletes for sure playing in Copa and in Euro in, in Europe for the Euros and then coming back to go directly into another tournament. Yeah. So that's intense. It is. It is. But I, I completely agree. It's intense. Obviously, there's ways to manage it. Whether I mean, the coach's job, the therapist's job to you know manage your load and make sure you're you're fresh for whenever you are picked to play. Um, I don't want to sound like it's our job. Like you know what I mean. Like yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm neither here nor there. I'm just asking. I, you know, as a I completely agree that there's moments where I'd be like, like, okay, we're you know, getting into a really tough spell here, like amount of games, but uh, you you got to dig deep. Like that's what you're playing here for. You're playing for for your career, for your earnings, for trophies, for for your city or whatever team you're in as well. And that's how I see it. I just see it as in like, okay, like yes, it's tough, but we know that I would say our off seasons are longer than most, especially if you don't make the playoffs. You could be done in mid October and you're starting again in January. And then yes, during the year it might be tough, but you know that you're gonna have that stretch of relaxation per se uh, at the end of the season. Well, that's actually a good question. So off season, what do you, what do you do in the off season? And most athletes, are they playing in some sort of league? Are they just doing simple training? I mean, we all know in 2024 athletes are no longer, you know, no one's off. 
you're not, you maybe get a day or two where you can eat some garbage and sort of, you know, put the feet up, watch some films. Otherwise you're sticking to a regiment so that you're well oiled. Even by the time you get to training, what do you do in, in your, uh, in your sort of regiment during the off season? Yeah. So we're all, obviously we're given a program to follow. And then if you want to year off fit a little bit and do your own specific things, you're more than welcome to, as long as you stay fit. Uh, for me personally, like I took, again, we were out early, so we were done in mid October. I it took a couple weeks, two and a half weeks to myself and just did absolutely nothing. No diving, no field work, a little bit of gym, nothing crazy, but just to rest those bumps. And flabby, you know, we'll be getting flabby. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but other than that, like, especially with, for me, living in Montreal, it's difficult to train outside. So you really have to find an indoor complex. And I've been lucky enough to, to have a complex near my house in, in the West Island because... You know, with my past uh, playing for Lakeshore, we have a dome in there, so I'm able to use it. But it's getting harder and harder to find uh, fields to play in, in in the winter, considering... In Montreal. In Montreal. And considering our winters are so long, you would think that there would be a lot more access to or more, more demand, facilities. More demand. The demand is there. But which just, would breed then more access, meaning more buildings built. Exactly. But that. Um, what we do, with, for me, it's a bit different because I'm a goalie, so... I need a goalie coach and I do have a couple of them that I've worked with in the past or when I was younger, who I've kept a great relationship with over the years and they're always, you know, like super excited to work with me in the off season and we have great relationships as well. So I do, you know, whether it's individual work with goalkeeper coaches or, um, we, there's a couple of different groups who organize small, uh, small side of games, whether it's 7v7 or even actually, I think two, three weeks ago, we had an 11v11 game and we're talking about players who were in the MLS who are playing uh, in other cities, uh, CPL, semi-pro. So you're just a lot of Quebec players who are all around the world, basically, who are in off-season at the same time. We're all oh, gathering yeah. and playing, you know, just to stay fit, right? And it's yeah. good, too, because levels levels high, and you everybody knows that, you know, what's at stake, and you're not going to flying in tackles because we're all in the same boat. No one's going to tackle and try and get someone hurt before preseason starts in a couple of weeks or mm-hmm. three weeks or whatever the... Yeah. the case may be than what we're training. So it's it's a good environment. And I think it also, I, I, I like it too, because for me, it's a blast from the past. I get to see people who I used to play the academy with back when I was like 17, 18 years old who are on different paths right now, or guys in the MLS who are playing at different teams uh, who, you know, like I could give an example, like Mo Farsi, who just won the MLS Cup of Columbus uh, at, yeah. uh, the last season. Yeah. So. He came back and trained with us, and again, like someone who we've known for so long, and it's just good to see those familiar faces. Sure, it's almost like it's it's like a football camp, exactly. summer camp, right? Where everybody gets together yeah. and sort of like yeah, they we can sense how does everybody do? Levels it? high, sure. Levels high, and also everybody gives some tips. Hey, most well, reliable learning yeah. over there. There's that. Uh, community wise, what do you feel the responsibility is as a footballer uh, for your community? You know, like how are you? going to tie in especially now in the new city um to the how are you going to connect with the community you know right because i think you know how heavy that is in my mind that community is key right so what are the plans um for you there once you get once you get rolling to sort of implement yourself in in the portland uh community yeah i think well first of all the way i see it as well like like you it's super important because not only i want to see like it's a say it to the extent that it's an obligation because for me, I personally am genuinely like being involved in the community, especially in Montreal. Um, I felt that since I was from there, I was the community. You know what I mean? Like I used to be in those people's shoes and I wanted to show that, you know, like I'm reachable and my, I can be, you know, like be there for these people or show them, you know, this is the path or if you go wanted to make it to this, uh, to this step in your career it's it's more than capable and i think nothing changes at portland obviously like i know nothing about portland i do know i did a little bit of research there is like a little bit of a greek community there too so i definitely want to tap into that and, mm-hmm. and see what's going on because i will be there for easter and not be home so i definitely mm-hmm. want to see what's going on over there. sure yeah but you, you, you can just implement yourself sure again yeah. this is the beautiful thing yeah. about being a pro athlete you literally send out a, a, yeah. a tweet I mean, there or a message like, yeah. hey, I'm I'm down. Or you tell the club, I want to be implemented. And that's what it is. Like, I know that, again, I haven't met all the people yet in the organization, but I, I'm assuming there's going to be people in place for a community, uh, community relations or uh, just 
helping me get out there. And that's something I'm going to definitely like look into when I, when I get to the club and meet the right people. Usually it's like media day when we do all our pictures and all that, you kind of meet like every different department and then you could kind of, you know, gather your information and then go from there. Okay. You're in charge of, you know, the school visits or the, um, uh, I don't know, visiting the park, cool. whatever the case. Feel, whatever it is. I mean, the, the, the list is okay. endless, right? Two banks. Are you open to that 100%? And then you get to know that person, then you go for it. Well, we're going to have you in some good gear down there. I can promise you that. Much. All right, so I'm going to put you on the spot, and uh, and then we'll, we'll get to the folk questions. Again, I don't want to take too much of your time. Again, the idea here on the first half uh, culture show is just, you know, quick check, get to know the, the person involved. I'm going to ask you for predictions on the three tournament <laughs> You can't not. I'm not going to bring in African Cups and, and Nations or uh, the Asia, the Asian uh, Championship that's happening this year in 2024. But I'm going to ask you the League's Cup. Who's winning it? I'm I'm going to say Porter. That's my man. Uh, in uh, the uh, Copa America in the U.S., who's winning it? Um, Canada. We got to qualify for it, but we're going to do it. Fly. We're going to beat Trini. And we're, yeah. It's going to happen. Okay. And let's pretend Canada didn't qualify, which they will, but they didn't. Who's your runner-up? You give it to Argentina? Uh, maybe Colombia. Colombia. All right. I think they'll do well. Aren't they in first place in their ball? Yeah, I, I know. But it, when, you know, I, mean, I know when tournament time starts. Yeah, when the ball turns on and then it's over. And he just turns on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Uh, and in the Euros, we got France. France. I don't know. They're just, they got so much depth. They're too strong. Man, I love it. That's it. Okay, so James, thank you so very much for joining us on the first half uh, podcast. Appreciate it. Congrats uh, on all the new adventures in the MLS. We're going to be following, you know, with big eyes, and um, we'll, we'll stay in touch. Right, and that's what we do. Always. Thanks again, thank you, man. Cheers. Hi, my name's Crystal from You and I Training. Today we'll be doing Bulgarian split squads. Um, in relation to training for soccer. The reason we're going to do those is because it targets the glutes, the hamstrings, and the quads. So I'll show you what that looks like. The rear foot is elevated. You shift your weight forward into your front heel. You're gonna go all the way down as far as you can and then push up through your heel to come up. If you have weights at home, you can hold them down by your sides. If this is too easy, you can add a little hop. And that's that.